Hello once again, and welcome to Tuesdays with Lloyds, an ongoing conversation with Lloyds underwriters and their distribution partners in both London and the U.S. My name is Pat Talley, Regional Director and Managing Agent Practice Group Leader for Lloyds in the U.S. Today, we're pleased to bring you another installment of our Syndicate Showcase series, a monthly event where we host top executives from a syndicate's senior leadership team to share their perspective on a variety of relevant topics and provide you, the audience, an opportunity to ask questions. So far this year, we featured Apollo and Aegis syndicates, and today we are very pleased to welcome Hiscox, which operates syndicates 33 and 3624 at Lloyd's. Joining us from Hiscox, our Chief Executive Officer for London Market, Kate Markham, Daniel Alpay, Line Underwriter for Flood at Hiscox, and Glenn Dore, Head of Broker Relations for Hiscox London Market. We've included a brief biography for each of our guests in the chat box for your further review. Moderating today's session will be my colleague and good friend, Don Marie Black. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. We encourage you to submit questions during the discussion, but please do this using the Q&A function and not the chat feature. We typically have hundreds of attendees, and this makes it much easier for us to monitor and organize the questions to ensure we an answer and address as many as possible. Today's session is being streamed live on YouTube and will be recorded. If you like the session, feel free to let your colleagues and clients know that they can catch it later online. We've been pleased to see that previous installments have had hundreds of views on our YouTube channel, and we're glad to offer an additional method for sharing this valuable content. And with that, welcome again to our guests, and Don Marie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pat. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Tuesdays with Lloyd session featuring the Hiscox Syndicate. And welcome to Kate, Glenn, and Dan, hopefully will be joining us shortly. And uh, as Pat mentioned, I am Don Marie Black. I am the U.S. Broker Practice Leader for Lloyd's Americas. And, um, and I'm really excited to present today um, the Hiscox Syndicate. A uh, long-standing syndicate in the London market, uh, first formed in 1901, so we're looking forward to hearing more. Before we get to that, we'd like to start with a short polling question. Uh, so Mark, if you could turn on the polling question. While we wait for the poll to close, I thought I would share a little bit about Hiscox London market. Hiscox London Market is part of the Hiscox Group, Hiscox Group, which has over 3,000 employees in 14 countries and customers worldwide. They are known for their long-term long partnership leadership in the market and their blend of underwriting expertise and meaningful capacity. I think that the quote from Kate, which comes from your website, Kate, um, perfectly sums up their approach. Whether it's unparalleled underwriting expertise at the box, thinking outside the box when it comes to our products and leading is at the heart of everything we do. And so with that, Mark, is the uh, poll ready? So it looks like we have 14% insureds or risk managers today, 17% retail brokers, 12% wholesale brokers, 8% Lloyd's broker, 6% cover holder, 16% underwriter, and 4% claims, uh, and then 22% others. So we'll be curious to see where you've all come from. So with that, I would like to direct the first question to you, Glenn. Uh, so you and I have had similar positions in the market for a number of years, uh, based here in the US, but promoting the Lloyd's market, which I know we're both very passionate about. So could you give us an overview, a brief overview of Hiscox London market, where it sits within the Hiscox group and then how it differs from Hiscox USA? USA? Sure, sure. Thanks, thank you, Don Marie. And, and again, hello and, and uh, welcome to Tuesdays uh, with Lloyd's. This is a great opportunity. Uh, as as Don Marie and, and uh, Pat have said, my name is Glenn Dorr and I head up broker relations for Hiscox London Market. And on behalf of my Hiscox colleagues, we wanna thank you for joining us today. And thanks to Lloyd's for giving us the stage really to showcase our business, our people, our special, in our specialty insurance solutions. You know, we pride ourselves in taking um, the, the lead in emerging risks. And we're gonna share with you some examples of what that looks like at Hiscox London Market, which will include later a highlight of our, of our US flood program. But before I turn it over to Kate, this is a good time to set the stage uh, and, and make the distinction of where Hiscox London Market sits within the group. Now, Hiscox Retail, Hiscox London Market, and Hiscox Re-ILS are three separate 
and distinct businesses within Hiscox Group. They all bring their own leadership, products, energy, and distribution channels to contribute to the overall success at Hiscox. Now, Hiscox USA, which some of you may know, being here in the States, is a big part of our retail segment. And it focuses on capturing its leading share of the growing small business market in the United States. And what we are gonna talk about today is where we work, which is Hiscox London Market, which is the syndicate at Lloyd's that specializes in delivering insurance solutions that are big ticket in nature and tailored to the demands and needs of niche market segments here in the US. This is especially the case for Hiscox London Market in delivering smart data-driven risk transfer solutions in the US in the ENS marketplace. And so with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Kate uh, and ultimately Dan to give us a little more of an excellent picture of what this all looks like in real terms. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Dawn-Marie, for having me along um, today. It's really lovely to be here. Um, I think, I mean, just to let me set the scene in terms of the overall strategy, one of the things that I think is really important in a very complex market that the ENS and the Lloyds marketplace is, is that we can dis differentiate ourselves and distinguish ourselves from everybody else. And this is something that um, I picked up when I joined the team just about three and a half years ago. Um, so we came up with a very simple strategy, which is I would boil it down into having a goal, a simple goal, which I'll come on to in a second. And then we deliver against that goal through three key priorities. So if I start with the goal, the overarching thing for us, the question we wanted to answer, given that we trade 100% through Lloyd's, was why would somebody choose to send a piece of business to Lloyd's? Um, why London? Why would you do that when you've got such a, an advanced and developed admitted market? And the key sort of the key insight that we came to is we think that Lloyd's and the London market more generally is always going to be the home to the big, complex, volatile and increasingly the really emerging risks out there. Um, it's the, it's the risks that, that other players either don't want to insure, don't quite know how to insure, don't have the capacity to insure, or just haven't quite cracked how to do it yet. And so that was, that was an insight that we felt was really compelling and was going to be future-proofed for us as we set ourselves out as a syndicate um, from a strategic point of view a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So with that, we came up with a simple sentence, and this is our overarching goal, and, and Glenn sort of hinted at it in his introduction, which is to lead the way in emerging risk. And I thought it might be helpful if I just unpack that a little bit um, and split the sentence down into two halves. So leading the way and emerging risk. So if I start with emerging risk, um, emerging risk can mean so many things to so many different people, different things to different people. But the way we sort of describe it is in two different ways. It's what I would call new, new risk. Um, these are the risks that are changing, emerging, evolving on a daily basis. And almost as quickly as we think we understand them, they change and move again. Um, cyber is a perfect example of this. Obviously, 20 years ago, it didn't really exist. There was no marketplace. There was no protection for clients from cyber risk and it is changing overnight um, as we speak. So it's a great example of an emerging risk that I think will continue to evolve and develop in the coming years. But there are many others. Um, if you pick up anything, any sort of uh, brochure talking about complex and emerging risk, people will touch on things like intangible risks um, that sit on balance sheets, things like reputational harm, um, brand risk, et cetera. And these are these more emerging risks that we're really keen to try and work with clients and our brokers to help understand those risks and find a way ultimately to provide solutions to protect clients from those risks. So that's, the, that's what we mean by emerging, sort of the new, new type of emerging risk. The second piece, and I think this is important to say, is given how rapidly everything in the world is evolving and changing, um, even the most traditional forms of industry, so be that um, oil and gas, be it marine, um, and marine has been around, as we know, in Lloyd's for over 300 years, they are facing new and emerging risks every single day. So. We've recently launched a product um, that, helps, um, that helps protect clients who need to decommission end of life oil rigs as an example. So it's got all the usual covers, but it's specifically tailored to help protect um, and um, support clients as they decommission um, end of life platforms in an environmentally sound way. 
Another example in marine would be autonomous shipping. That whole world is going to change, I'm sure, in the next five and 10 years. So um, that's another example of emerging risk. So um, if I move on to sort of the second half of the goal, leading the way, um, obviously in Lloyd's, there are leaders and there are followers. And it very, very clearly sets out our soul that we want to lead. Um, and you know that's going to take investment, it's going to take commitment, it takes building capabilities that are required to make sure that we are seen and recognized as a leader in the marketplace. It also, we found, is a really, really great phrase to use internally in terms of it sets a standard, it sets the bar very high, and we have a conversation with people around, you know, is that going to help us lead the way? Is, it, is that project, is that investment? Is that um, deliverable going to help us lead the way um, as we head forward? So we found that as a language, that concept of leading the way is something we're really, really excited by. So on that front, you know, just to summarize, that's our goal, um, leading the way in emerging risk. And we know that is not something that we can, we can actually deliver against in a sort of 12 month time horizon. That's a multi-year goal that we're setting out um, to achieve. But it's supported through what, what I would summarize as three key priority areas for us that we invest in year after year. The first one is around um, distribution. So we really want to make sure that Lloyd's and London doesn't just mean trading at the box in, in, with paper in person in London. And obviously electronic distribution allows us to be anywhere, anytime, 24-7. So we're investing really, really heavily in electronic distribution. The second thing is data. Um, I'm sure we're going to talk about data a lot today. It's exploding and our ability to use it, to harness it, to generate underwriting insight from it is becoming better on a daily basis. And we want to invest in the capability so that we can really harness that data to give us a competitive advantage. And the third piece, and this is around um, product leadership, you know, again, going back to that question of why would somebody choose to send a risk to London? We hope the answer to one of those questions is because the products are different and better to what is available elsewhere. And so we are setting out our stall to come up with products which we think are differentiated, are superior, and are, we are committed to keeping them at the front, at the front edge of, um, of that product on an ongoing basis. So we see products like Flood, um, we see us investing in those. Uh, we're now in year six of investing in the private Flood product for the US market started in 2015 and that will continue year after year after year we will be working out what we need to do to keep flood at the at the front at the front of the pack and Dan has arrived just perfect timing, perfect timing. so <laughs> let's so, so to just sort of wrap it up um, and Dan you may have missed um, my sort of introductory speech but just just to sort of wrap it up, I hope we've got a very clear um, and differentiated strategy in terms of how we want to play. Leading the way in emerging risk is the overarching goal, um, but we do deliver it on a day-to-day -day basis by investing in data, investing in distribution and investing in product leadership. Um, and I thought it would be really lovely for Dan to join me here today because he leads our Flood Plus, Flood Plus, um, Plus product, which is a perfect example of how those things come together. That was terrific. Thank you, Kate. And I think what we'd love to do now is really bring what Kate's laid out in terms, in terms of their approach um, in a real life example. So welcome, Dan. We're really happy to have you here with us today. Thank you. Um, yep. Sorry, technical difficulties. No, that's all right. We're all, that's, it's the world we're living in, right? Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about the history of the flood product and why Hiscox saw a need for this product in the U.S. market? Yeah, sure. So I guess for anyone who knows about flood insurance on the call, apologies, I'm probably going to tell you what you already know, but um, I'll just give you a bit of background on, on flood insurance in general um, in the US and it, how it's changed over the last sort of 100 years. So originally flood insurance used to be covered under a normal homeowners or commercial policy in the US. And after uh, you know, decades of losses in the, in the sort of tens and early 1910s and 20s, um, insurance carriers started excluding flood as a peril. And ultimately it came down to the fact that, you know, the, the technology wasn't around to understand the peril of flood at the granular level that you need to. So the easiest thing was to exclude it from, from policies, which is how it has been until 
2012. And after a few more decades of basically the government bailing out people when they had floods um, in terms of grants and subsidies, in the sort of late 60s, they decided that it would be good to try and set up a, an organization to provide some sort of insurance, which is how the NFIP came into existence. And the idea being they were already paying out the claims, so they may as well get some money for it and try and educate um, people on the peril of flood and to increase take up. So they were the sort of three original tenets of the NFIP was to raise awareness of flood uh, and educate the public, to increase the number of policies in the NFIP and to make coverage affordable. And so fast forward a few more decades and, and the last two points of that have made um, of course, some financial issues for the NFIP, mainly because they um, they have to make the cover affordable and therefore not necessarily actuarially based pricing. And obviously, the the growth in cities like Miami and Houston and just general population in the US has meant that they've ended up with some serious accumulations of of aggregations in the in the US, and which they're exposed to and, and they've been sort of caught out in a few major events, namely Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. So fast forward to 2012 and, and the, the NFIP was in tens of billions of debt. And from that, the, the Bigger Waters Act sort of took place in 2012, which the main purpose of which was to move the NFIP to actuarially based pricing, but a sort of side product of which was to open up private um, insurance to the private market as well. So from 1968 until 2012, uh, if you had a, a federally backed mortgage and you were in what was deemed as being a flood, um, a flood zone, you could only um, buy uh, flood insurance from the NFIP. And so there was an, a sort of a private excess market and a, and a forced placed market around it, but they were very small in comparison. Mm -hmm. And so post 2012, obviously this market suddenly opened up to, to private carriers. Um, now in 2014, a second act sort of came through to repeal uh, some of those actuarially based prices, but the private market remained. And after sort of a, a few years of, I guess, of sizing up the opportunity and, and seeing what it meant, we, along with a few other private carriers, decided in 2014 to tentatively dip our toe in. Um, and, and that was the start of our flood book. So the initial strategy of, of not just Hiscox, but most of the Lloyds and, uh, and domestic private market was to take the NFIP form um, find out areas where we knew they didn't make money and, and you know, take some discount off the price. But in terms of an actual product, it was no better than what the NFIP was offering. And, mm -hmm. and we obviously quite early on figured out that that strategy wasn't going to work in the medium to long term um, because the customer wasn't getting anything better than they currently had. And the NFIP itself as a product hasn't really changed over the last three or four decades in, in that the coverage is... $250,000 for, for a dwelling and $100,000 for, for contents for homeowners and $500,000 for buildings and $500,000 for contents for, for businesses. And obviously that isn't that adequate anymore. It, it might have been 30 years ago. And, and, the main, and the main reason they have these sort of limitations in their policies is that they have to insure everyone. So the only way they can actually control their claims cost is by having a very limited form. And so we sort of sat there and thought, well, what if we did it the other way around? And we had a very broad form, but we're very selective about who we insured. And obviously being a private market, we had that luxury that they didn't. Mm -hmm. And so we set about building um, uh, a platform to allow us to do that. And over the last six years, we've developed a product and, a, and an underwriting platform called Flood Plus that allows us to write full value policies up to two and a half million dollars um, for commercial or residential um, buildings and that's now 90% of what we do in our flood book and we're, we've got to the stage where we have 50,000 policyholders um, and growing and are seeing sort of 15,000 quotes a week through the platform so it's been a success story for Hiscox in terms of growing a digital business and, and hopefully uh, we've, we've added a, a good product uh, for the US flood market both from a retail perspective and, and a customer perspective. So, Dan, we had a, a question come in the Q&A, which is going to lead nicely into your next section. So how is the flood product distributed and how different is this to traditional risks written in the Lloyd's market? Okay, yeah, um, good question. So I guess the, 
when when we sort of started building the flood book we we realized three things quite quickly so firstly flood it, you can't be understated how complicated flood is as a peril um it, you know you can have two houses side by side one gets um, flooded the other doesn't and so you need to know you know in a, in a hurricane if you're on the same stretch of land usually you have similar levels of damage whereas a storm surge it can be completely different depending on the elevation of the land you're on and so you need to have data down to a very very granular level um and therefore it's quite hard a traditional binding authority we put rates in a contract usually in a simple rating guide or an excel spreadsheet um it's quite hard to do that with flood and get it accurate enough um the the sort of second thing i guess is that um flood probably more than any other peril um, needs spread you need spread on a very granular level down to you know individual parcels because the when an area floods you have huge accumulations and the damage ratio ends up being pretty high and we've seen that in hurricane harvey and, and other events since the, the nebraska floods a couple of years ago where entire towns are sort of inundated with water and every single property gets affected so being able to build nationwide spread and spread at a granular level is very important and the third thing we sort of realized was that most flood premiums are actually very low. So, um, you know, the, lo the lower risk, the lower the premium, but it's quite hard for us and for our cover order partners to actually to transact premiums, which are 350 bucks and make a profit. So in doing it in the traditional under underwriter binder sort of route. So we obviously concluded we needed to build a system and we thought the system needed to do a few things. So. Um, it needed to be cutting edge technology wise in terms of being able to return premiums really quickly, but also underlay the pricing with uh, catastrophe models in real time. So, um, which is something we, ha we hadn't done before as a business. And that sort of real time aspect was also important in being able to control rates because ultimately we were getting into a market which didn't exist before. So us being able to see what quotes are coming in, see what's binding, and get an idea of what the what the private market price was for something. And being able to adapt on the fly was crucial. Um, and we also came up, you know, again, pretty early on with the idea that we wanted this to be Hiscox controlling the pricing and our cover holder partners controlling the front end distribution and policy lifecycle. So we basically link in via an API to lots of cover holders across the US, um, all over the US. We actually run every state bar Alaska. Um, and they, you will go into their system and you'll see their questions set, their branding and their policy life cycle. But when you actually ask for a quote that in real time pings to London, we come up with a price and we, we ping a quote back. And so we see, um, we see all, everything coming through our system on our end, but the cover holder still maintains the control and the relationships on the, on the retail level. Um, and I guess the, the sort of um, the last thing we sort of learned, I guess, um, or which was important for us to learn was to build a system that was going to be as light touch as possible. So, you know, we've seen the NFIP is over 100 questions they ask in order to get a flood quote. And, and a key differentiator for us and for a lot of private markets was how do we ask fewer questions um, in order to make it a smoother process for the retailer and the customer? And ultimately, that comes down to supplementing our data by buying in third party data that's already available. Um, so we've managed to get down between 12 and 15 questions, depending on some of the answers, um, which obviously massively reduces the time to get a quote and makes it just an easier journey for, for everyone involved. That's excellent. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, so it, I think that we could answer the question in terms of um, a retailer can go to the cover holder to access the Flood Plus product, correct? C correct, yep. So we have probably about 45 distribution partners now across the US. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be very regionally split um, and, and some of them are sort of the, the, I guess, bigger, more national players. Um, and so retailers can go to those cover holders to get, um, to get access to the product. Great. And I, I'd really like to talk a little bit about um, data and how are you using data and price um, to assess and price risk? Yeah, sure. So I guess that for us, that's the that's the real strength of having a system versus having a binding or a typical binding authority contract. So um, we 
we obviously when we when we get a quote through we collect the the 12 questions or 15 questions which which get answered and in addition to all of the extra data that we buy on that particular location um and so we're, we're doing the pricing at a very granular level but we're also collecting data along the way to give us insight into which prices are working and which prices aren't so um when when somebody binds a policy we also receive that information and this is obviously unlike any other binding authority that that we write at least in, in hiscox in that we have the data in real time so we get to see conversion rates for new business we can see renewal retentions and we can also see the impact of a price change so uh, an example you know suffolk county new york new york let's say has a a conversion rate that's much lower than our average across new, the rest of the state of new york um, we will look at that and we will say, okay, are we are we just too expensive there? And if we've got enough margin from a modelled perspective, we know we can drop the rates um, by 10% and we see what happens to the conversion over the next few weeks. If it doesn't move, we can drop it again. And likewise, you know, if we're if the conversion rate's too high, we probably know that we're too we're too cheap in a certain area. So we can optimize our pricing, not just um, not just on a technical basis, but to ensure that we're getting the right spread we need. Um, and so this is this is quite new from a from a sort of binding authority perspective in Lloyd's, um, having that data readily available, and with sort of hundreds of rating variables in the back end of our algorithm to to sort of play with, we we can't rely on traditional sort of techniques to you know in an Excel sheet to work out the trends and insights that we need to gauge from that data. So we've actually got to the stage where we we started to use machine learning algorithms to try and predict which quotes are going to bind and which quotes aren't going to bind and and we can do you know in some segments to a 99 percent accuracy we we know exactly what combinations of parameters for a particular risk will lead to us binding that risk which which also means we can help our cover holders um ultimately not waste their time or the retailers time in putting something through the system if it's not going to work um which is obviously great and, and is a, a sort of level of detail we've never had before um, so, so we, we're using data, we're using data for that basis, which is, which is great. And we can also use data to ensure, um, that as we're, as we're going along, we're optimizing a book to, to look how we want it to look. So the traditional, so I guess the, the an idea to give you a, uh, to give you an idea of the power of a system in a traditional binding authority contract in Lloyd's, if a cover holder writes a risk for us on the 1st of January, by the time it makes it onto a, an Excel border row, um, which then comes to us and gets uploaded, um, cleanses and uploaded into our Katashi models, we don't actually see that risk in our system till April, which is obviously a massive lag. And if let's say we've spotted a trend that something's going wrong with either the rating, the type of risk being written, um, or something wrong with the geography of, of the risk, we only notice it in April. And by the time we make a change to that cover holder contract, we obviously have to have a phone call with them. We decide we want to make a change. They need to change their rating in their system. And then it only becomes um, effective for quotes 30 to 60 days time. You know, it's, it's half a year before we've made it, we've spotted something's wrong and done something to implement the change for that. Whereas now we can spot trends by the day if we wanted to, and we could change rates in the system immediately. And that, that ultimately gives us a huge competitive advantage in being able to react to things um, much faster than we would do if we were sort of in the traditional binding authority setup, and ultimately ensures that we can build a long-term profitable and competitive product. Sorry, just looking at the questions. There's there's quite a few coming in for you, Dan. So uh, we'll save those until we get a little bit further through. So okay. last year was the most active hurricane season on record. How did this impact the flood market? Okay, good question. Um, yeah, it was. It, yeah, it's, it was uh, the the most active hurricane season on record, and and yeah, we've we've sort of not had the greatest luck in terms of starting a, a new line of business um, in terms of hurricanes over the last five years. Um, but actually, we, we've been pretty resilient um, in the face of these storms. So so. Part of that is down to us having a very well spread portfolio. So we typically will see business in states which wouldn't come into the ENS property market for other perils. 
Um, so we have a we have a very large inland and west coast presence with the flood book that you don't typically see on homeowners and commercial risks. So that that spread means we've got pockets of profit in other places in the US to offset the the hurricane bet that we run. Um, and that spread sort of goes down to a zip level as well. So we can ensure through the system that we're not insuring every single house on one street, um, which obviously is where things go horribly wrong when a hurricane happens to hit somewhere close by. So we've been we've we've done pretty well through the hurricane seasons. We did early on um, when we first started the book. We were unfortunate that fortunate and unfortunate that Hurricane Harvey um, sort of, sort of hit us pretty early on, and you know that was we we paid the claims and we and we sort of learned a lot about the product and the requirement to have spread in the portfolio. Um, and ultimately, it was it was good for us to have the product tested and for the claims process to be tested. So. All in all, I think we've 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 fared pretty well, and um, and hopefully we'll have a slightly quieter hurricane season in twenty twenty one. Yes, we're we're all hoping. Um, so there are a few questions in the chat, Dan. Do you, would you like them now, or would you like to wait? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I don't mind if I do them now. Okay, if we're excellent. on topic, it might be easier. So the first one is, does the insured have to buy the cover from NFIP as primary cover with Hiscox being excess of NF NFIP? Uh, so, so the answer is no. So um, we, we offer full value cover up to two and a half million. Mm -hmm. um, so if the, if, the, if the home or commercial building is two and a half million in value, we can ensure, um, we can ensure the entire thing under our products. And we also cover loss of use coverage for homes or BI coverage for commercial properties. Um, and actually the, the coverage is very, um, very similar to an HO3 or HO5 form for homeowners or a special form for commercial. So we've mirrored it on that basis. Um, we give up to 70% contents and we give dedicated other structures coverage as well. So you can buy full value. We also offer an NFIP lookalike limits option, which gives 250, 100,000 coverage. It's still on the broader form, but it's so that you can have an apples to apples comparison with the NFIP price. And we also have the ability to essentially do the excess as well. So if somebody, you know, if somebody decides actually the NFIP works out um, better for them on a pricing basis, but they still want the coverage to go up to full value, they could place the coverage with the NFIP and we, and we can do the excess through the system too. Great. And um, is the Hiscox cover replacement cost? Uh, it is, yeah. Yes. So it's, it's a replacement cost for buildings and for contents. It's uh, it's ACV, but you can buy replacement costs as an ex, uh, as an optional extra. Okay. And one more for you before we pivot back to Kate. Uh, how do you separate claims from wind damage versus flood damage in a hurricane? Very good question. Um, so this is yeah, this is a sort of uh, an issue, I guess, in general. Um, We've always on the on the hurricane on the wind side uh, for, on our property book taken into account some some form some of leakage. Like there will be some claims which you just can't tell where it's come from. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the time, when there isn't total loss, you can see from where the water line is on the building that it's had a flood loss on whether it's had a flood loss or not. Um, and obviously, if it's just roof damage, then it's wind. There there will always be a grey area. Um, and we just have to accept that and, and build it into our pricing. That's great. Thank you. It's just, I'm getting, there's a lot of comments about what an amazing product it is. And one of the other questions that just came in, so Dan, I'm going to let you out of the hot seat for a second. Uh, so Kate, it sounds like the, the question is, or the comment, it sounds like you have built a really neat platform, a uh, data platform for a flood. Do you have any ambitions to expand that platform to other lines of business? And have you assessed how the platform could integrate with the digital transformation described in Blueprint to Future at Lloyd's? Oh, wow. Okay, great right. question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I don't know if Ben's all. typed that one in for me. Um, no, <laughs> yes, definitely. We have thought about extending it. Um, and actually, We've already launched a residential buy and plus product, so offering the homeowners cover. And we are imminently about to launch a commercial um, buy and plus product. So again, the commercial property cover that will all, it's all based on the same platform. 
the same concept of being fed by APIs plugged into the cover holder systems and with the, um, the data and the rating and the algorithms, that sort of brainchild sitting back in London. So we definitely have replicated it. Um, and it's something that we are significantly investing in, as I say, the commercial products and build at the, mo at the moment. In terms of the plug into Blueprint at Lloyd's, um, it, it fits and it fits into what's called the standardized risk exchange. So the way I would, I would describe the future at Lloyd's sort of operating models, I think there are two ways of working. One is the big open market syndicated risks, big complex, individually underwritten, um, less about standard forms and policy wordings. Um, and those need to be looked at and looked at individually. So that's one operating model that we're, we're building at the moment. Um, the, the second one is the standardized risk exchange, which is much more around standardized product wording, standardized um, approaches fed by APIs, which can go through that platform. So if you think about the way Dan has described the Flood Plus product, we could literally plug it, plug it straight into that platform when that platform exists in Lloyd's. Um, it will be the same for the residential um, product, the commercial product and the others that we'll build out um, to follow. So we hope that by investing in these and investing in our own distribution, as soon as Lloyd's is ready, we'll be ready to plug in because the APIs will all be in existence. Um, so that kind of will lead us a little bit into, uh, so I'm moving around questions, Kate, I hope that's okay. So, but what are the plans for Hiscox London market on the underwriting side for 2021 and beyond? And do you have plans to grow in the US, which sort of piggybacking off of talking about the flood and the other products you're being bringing to market? Presumably the answer is yes, but could you expand upon that? Yeah, of course. The answer is yes. So we are definitely keen to grow in the US and Flood is a perfect example of one of the products that we're seeking to grow, um, you know, strongly over the next few years. Um, I guess my comment on 2021 specifically is we are looking to grow, but we're not looking to grow quite as fast as the rate increases that we're seeing might suggest. Um, and that's because there are two things going on within our overall London market portfolio at the moment. We are still in the middle of, or to hopefully nearing the end of some remediation work that we've had to do on some of the lines of business that we write. That is very much aligned to the Lloyd's Decile 10 thinking and where we haven't been seeing the returns that we've needed over the last three or four years. So we've got a little bit more of that to do in 2021. But running alongside that, we are rapidly growing in what we call our investment lines. And these are, the, these are the product lines that I, I talked about when I talked about investing in products over the multiple years. So Flood is our first ever investment line, six years old. We actually, we had five investment line products a few years ago. We now have 10. Um, and our, our hope and our, our ambition is to grow the number of investment lines um, every year as we line up the resources, the technology, the data, the distribution capability behind those. So many of those lines, we're looking to grow and looking to grow very strongly in the US market. Excellent. And there was a CNR question, but I think it might be a little bit more, maybe we'll throw it to Glenn because he, he knows all lines. Um, would you be able to talk about the K&R market that Hiscox underwrites and where you see the future of the market? Um, in terms of premiums, limits, and coverage. So Glenn, feel free that we can defer and, and get back to the person who asked, or you can take a whack at it. I'll, I'll take a whack at it, but I think, you know, I think Kate too will have some insight um, into, this, uh, uh, into this topic. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, K Hiscox is known for, for K&R. And uh, earlier, well, I guess later in, in 2020, uh, the special risk groups that in London, that was a, I mentioned three business units at the beginning. There were four. The SIR, that the, uh, spe the special risk business, was moved into London market under Kate's leadership. So k &R out of London, special risk, um, our SIR product all emanate um, out, of, out, of our, out of our syndicate there uh, in, in London. And that's become a big part and probably, Kate would agree, a very much of a growing part for, our, for that line of business in the United States in 2021. Um, what else can I say about that? Um, it, it's it's distributed 
the way it has been in many years uh, out of the United States through various uh, uh, cover holders uh, and or big brokers into London, uh, into the syndicate, uh, into our underwriters there. Um, I, in terms of just changing that distribution mix up, probably not too much of that um, as, it, as it sits the way it works now works quite well. But the product itself is something that um, we're, we're looking to grow and looking to always make stronger. We've got a strong relationship with a third party uh, entity called Control Risks that supports all our KNR and SIR policies uh, that provides significant uh, data and intelligence uh, for our customers who buy our KNR and, and our SIR products. That Control Risks has, uh, a, you know, we have that uh, an explicit and um, exclusive relationship with those guys that gives us an additional firepower for that particular product. And I don't know, maybe, Kate, maybe you've got some additional insights into what, what it might be or what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Glenn. k and <laughs> is definitely one of our investment lines. So it's one of the 10. It's one of the things we're fully committed to and seeking to grow, as Glenn has said. In terms of the way the product is going to develop, I haven't got the specifics with me here today. It's actually a live project because, as Glenn's explained, we've just sort of taken over leadership of the k and um, portfolio. But one of the things we're doing, as an example, with control risks is control risks actually gather threat information, as an example. They gather it real time globally. They have their finger on the pulse of anything and everything that's going on anywhere at a moment's notice. But we've never tapped into that data, as an example, in terms of underwriting real time in the way that Dan's been talking about doing it for the flood product. So that's a very live line of sort of um, exploration for us at the moment in partnership with control risks is to say, let's have a look at that data. What have you got? How can we use it? How could we build it into our rating and our, and our underwriting rules so that we can then enhance that product off the back of it? But we're probably, we're probably 12 months off having the answer to that. We're just at the point of working out what they've got and how we might be able to use it. Great, thank you both. Um, so we're going to, we've been sort of looking forward. Let me just stop and take a little bit of a pause and look back at 2020. Uh, I think a year we all would like to forget in some ways, um, but also a year that's been really, we've learned a lot, we've grown, we've embraced technology. Uh, Kate, you and I were talking prior to coming on that, you know, the world looks different now and it's going to keep, we're going to embrace that and carry that forward. So. What would you have imagined at the beginning of 2020 that the underwriting room would be, would you have imagined that the underwriting room would have been closed at the beginning of 2020 um, for much of the year? And tell us how you've managed that. Yeah, I mean, who could have imagined it? Um, I don't think any, I haven't met anybody that ever thought that might happen. The underwriting room had never closed. It didn't close during the war. It didn't close during any of the disasters that have happened. So no, we definitely didn't anticipate it. Um, when it did happen, actually, we, we were thrilled with the way the business responded. Um, we were very lucky. I think we were one of only three syndicates that had what's called electronic stamps. So the ability to bind a risk without uh, physically putting down you know, a stamp on ink with ink and signing underneath. So we were able to move home um, overnight and not miss, not miss a step in terms of being able to bind risks to keep writing business. And we were thrilled with, with what that happened. In terms of the early days, you can imagine when we started, we didn't think it was going to last this long. Um, everything ground to a halt. There were no client visits. There were no um, sort of, you know, business development discussions were happening. So actually service levels were better than they ever had been because everybody was just full time processing their work that was coming in and, and responding to, to quotes and things and opportunities. What we found over the time, though, is we found a way to get those client meetings back in to start to do more of those business development discussions. It's definitely not the same as, as face to face. And I, I know and I'm maybe Dan will comment. I'm sure when we can jump back on planes and get over to the US, we, we will be doing that to see people in person again. But we haven't stopped. Um, so, you know, my summary is I'm thrilled with how it's gone. I'm surprised, I never could have seen it happening. And I think the key for us now is to bank all the positives that have come out of it in terms of turbocharging, digitization, um, turbocharging our belief that we can trade and be more flexible and more agile, 
but to bring back the best of the bits that we hugely miss, you know, the relationships, the networking, the social side of the insurance market, and our opportunity to really work through some complex problems face to face with people. So I think that bit will come back. But overall, it's not been it's not been the disaster we might have anticipated it, it could have been. Mm -hmm. And there's so much discussion going on about the future of the Lloyd's Underwriting Room, just in terms of what it's going to look like. It, it clearly will always be there. So I think as we move forward, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's an opportunity for participation in helping to shape that and a lot of conversations going on. And knowing that we've got so many US stakeholders on the, on the um, presentation today, uh, it's just a reminder to the US audience that there's input, uh, opportunity for, for, for input from you as well. So it's certainly welcomed as we think about how, how the underwriting room will be shaped going forward. So, uh, so let's keep forward going now um, and talk a little bit about the future. So the industry is undergoing a lot of change. Uh, the pandemic has only served to um, move that change forward faster. And so if we can go back to talking a little bit about uh, Blueprint 2, and some of your thoughts around that. Um, and Kate, I understand that you sit on the uh, Lloyd's Claims Board. Yes, I do. So we can talk a little bit about claims and I think you'll have some, some unique insights. Uh, so for example, claims is Lloyd's is facilitating faster claims processing by automating, automating claim recognition, routing and orchestration. So how do you view the role of technology in the industry and specifically for Hiscox? Yeah, I mean, let me start, let me start with Lloyd's and then I'll come back to Hiscox in a minute and, and Dan, prepare, I'm going to come back to you again. But in terms of Lloyd's, um, I heard John Neal speak very recently and he, he was able to sort of boil the future at Lloyd's program down into a few very um, simple priorities, claims being one of them. But the other one that he really, really majored in on was data. So if you, if you imagine a world where Lloyd's is um, fast, slick, automated, digital, efficient, the only thing that's going to enable that is data and having a common clear understanding of what data is required at different stages in the journey, having um, clean data, having everyone using the same definitions of data. So there is a huge amount of nitty gritty, um, fairly tricky work going on at the moment to define what they call the core data record, which is what data do we need for each stage of the journey that a risk would go through. So when it's coming into Lloyd's to, to be quoted, when it subsequently is bound, it, and then ultimately if it goes on to make a claim or is renewed, et cetera, that data builds up in the way they're sort of looking at it as Lego blocks actually. You know, Lego block number one is what you need to bind the risk. Lego block number two is what you would then need to renew that risk and so on. Um, and that is the underpinning of everything that they're doing. So if I talk about claims a little bit, the core data record obviously is the number one thing that we're working on in claims. Um, that is the defining what we need to be able to process a claim in a fully automated way is the key step that, that's being worked on in terms of open market. So the goal for 2021 is to be able to launch version one of a new system to, to actually process a claims record through from um, FNOL, so first notification of loss, all the way through to the accounting and settlement process in an automated way. And of course, the key work going on there is getting clear on the data that's required to do that so it can go through that process. In terms of um, delegated authority, the, the real focus here is actually, it's not massively futuristic, it's on process re-engineering. So having done some work over the last 18 months, they've realized there is a huge opportunity just to improve the way the process works, to remove duplication, to simplify things. And that can all be done without being dependent on a brand new system. So the system piece is focused on the open market and the delegated piece really is looking at um, process improvement, which of course will only help when the system comes along. The third piece it claims is really looking at is around um, faster payments. So again, we're really, really keen to come up with a sort of new technology solution that's gonna allow payments to be made quicker um, and more cleanly. And that's something, again, we think we can do that in a fairly ring fenced way whilst we're working on the other building blocks and then ultimately it will all be tied back together. So <clears throat> really exciting and you know, as I say, having sat on the board, I think what I love about the way the claims team in particular are approaching it is they, 
are not trying to take it as one big, huge, complex challenge. They're breaking it down into individual building blocks. They're progressing the most relevant and pertinent building blocks in parallel with a clear vision of how they're going to tie it all together at the end. So I think it's a really compelling approach, but the key thing is the data is underpinning, underpinning all of it. On Hiscox, um, you know, I mean, I've sort of talked a little bit about our investment in digital products. Flood is a great example of that. Data is the other, you know, I touched on it in my intro in terms of our investment in data. And um, this, is, this is sort of the, the number one project for us at the moment is building our data capability. Um, and if I, if I give you one example of this, um, and then I might turn back to you, Dan, just to see if you want to cover off some of the data, third party data sources you're using to, to inform the rating and the underwriting of Flood Plus, because I think we haven't covered that. But we, we've written a, a pretty large um, homeowners book and commercial property book um, through binding authorities for a number of years. And we're obviously fed by Bordereau, um, which come in, and we've had that data for many, many years. What we've never had is the ability really to analyze that data. So we could do it on an ad hoc basis um, as a one-off. We hired some data scientists two or three years ago and we gave them a project was trying to combine claims and risk data from household um, Bordereau and they managed to do it on a one-off, but it was not repeatable. It wasn't reusable. So it gave us some really interesting insights as a one off, but it wasn't something that was embedded and it was something that we could use again and again and again. So what we started to do, um, and it, we started 18 months ago, was to create a whole new environment within Hiscox. So we've, we've built technology in the cloud. These are all things I knew nothing about. So we've, we've moved technology to the cloud. We've sourced a whole load of clever tools. And now the, um, what we've done is taken five years of historical data from our homeowners portfolio. Um, that's risk border row data and claims border row data. We've cleansed it, put it in the cloud, and we've now analyzed it for the first time ever. Um, and it's done in a way that it's repeatable. So the underwriting team in London have got their hands on this data for the very first time. They're using it to inform their one four renewals, so the binder renewals. And we're hoping that that is data that we can now share with our cover holders and say, look, you know, we've been able to analyze five years of this book. These are the things we can see. These are the insights that we've identified that we've never seen before. Now, how can we use this together to help drive the business forward? How can we grow more profitable business? How can we work together to improve this going forward? Um, but the key thing that I'm really excited about with that is it's repeatable. So that data is coming in through the Lloyds infrastructure. We're using something called D DDM, which is the old DA SATS tool that sucks up that border row. Um, and it's coming in every month. And what we're working on now is making that process effectively fully automated. We haven't cracked it yet, but that's the next step. And then we'll roll that out over our other binder books. So that's one example, I think, of how we're really trying to build a digital infrastructure, put things in the cloud, but at the same time, create the capability to actually harness data to generate insights, which is going to allow us to write more profitable business. It's, it's a big job, but it's a really exciting one. So Dan, can I, can I if Dawn Marie, if it's okay, I'll ask Dan maybe to comment because he's, he's ahead of the curve in terms of using data for rating. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I guess, um, yeah, we're, we're the, the capture of claims data is, is probably even more important for us in a product which we've built ourselves and don't don't necessarily have the claims experience to tell us what all of the extra coverages we give are. So we've obviously built a product above and beyond what the NFIP offers and, and lots of the coverages we give within that form. Um, we, we don't know at all what the additional claims costs associated with them are. Um, obviously we've been careful about not giving too much cover away, but that's one of the things we, we were very conscious of from the start is how do we build up a data set as this goes to be able to figure out what are the actual added benefits of our product over the NFIP and other private markets and ensure that we're charging the right price for those extra coverages. So from a, from a claims data perspective, um, obviously Kate touched on the fact that we're gonna be doing the same thing on, on flood over the next year or so. And luckily we haven't had that many claims yet for the data to be that reliable but um but obviously it, it's a it's great to be able to have the claims sync up with the with the underwriting risk 
Um, and I think it's sort of crazy that it's 2021 and we're we're only just doing this as, a, as an industry. But part of that is the fact that the the industry is fragmented in a sense of the distribution we get business from is spread all across the US with different cover holders, different data standards, um, which which does make it much more complicated. And the the upside of having things in one system at the, at the front end, at the underwriting end, um, means that you've got some consistency in data and underwriting so that when we get the claims at the back end, it's easier to draw insights and conclusions. Um, so, so sort of a, a, an example on, on the data we use on, on the upfront side, on the underwriting side, um, I'll just give you a quick sort of user journey of, of how we analyze the risk. Um, obviously, when a, when a risk comes in, we need to know where it is, importantly, first. So we have a couple of geocoding engines which we use to, to get it down to a rooftop level. And if the risk doesn't get to a rooftop level, then we have a, a greater degree of uncertainty about what that flood risk is. Um, and, and so because of that, we will, we will build in an extra layer of uncertainty in our pricing. Um, once we've geocoded and we know exactly where it is, then it's, then it's really trying to figure out how, how risky it is from a flood perspective. And we gauge that by first pulling in data about the elevation of the property, uh, how far it is from the coast, how far it is from the nearest water source, that could be a river or a stream. Um, and we, we use various, various catastrophe models, um, RMS, uh, cat risk, Intermap, uh, SSBN. So we've got, we actually went down, down the path of trying to license all of them and then figure out over, over a sort of five to 10 year period, which one's the best. Um, and the, the flood models are probably in their infancy compared to wind models. So nobody's got it completely right. And that's just models in general, I think. Um, but the flood models even more so because it's such a granular peril and it's and the, the science behind it is so complicated, there will always be an element of we need to just hedge our bets and try and really spend time researching what what the nuances of each of these models are. So we will we will ultimately get a position within a model when we run it that we have four or five different views of risk for an individual property. And then ultimately we weigh up those models and our, our view of the market pricing to see what we want to ultimately charge or, or whether we want to write the risk at all. Um, and all of those data points, we obviously collect and build up a story as we go over time. So since Flood Plus started, we've actually had over 6 million quotes put through the system. And so we have 6 million rows of data, but more importantly, each of those rows of data have three to 400 columns of data across and every single parameter we can think of in terms of what we use for pricing. So the data sets are getting so large that traditional techniques just don't work on analyzing them. And the dream would be to obviously marry these up with actual real life claims to try and figure out actually are the models right? Because the industry is very reliant on models um, for most catastrophe perils, but they are models and, and claims experience is a lot better, although a bit more painful to, to get in the first place. <laughs> So I hope, yeah, hopefully that sort of covers covers a bit on the day side, Kate. Well, it does. Thanks, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kate. That that was exactly what I wanted to cover. Is 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 the volumes? The volumes of data are impossible, and you just can't do it via Excel spreadsheets. Yeah. 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 True. Exactly. Yeah. Or back in the days when I was underwriting, just using the old flood map, right? <laughs> so <thank> <laughs> we've come a long way well i am getting the uh the warning that our time is is sadly up today i've really enjoyed this conversation thank you all uh, thank you for your insights uh the data story i i just i'll end with the quote that i started with leading the way is at the heart of everything we do and you're clearly making that you know that point today in terms of what you're doing in data what you're doing in the flood space so Thank you all. It's been wonderful to have you. Brilliant. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yourself. Thank you. Okay. And so that brings us to the end of another thought provoking session of Syndicate Showcase. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to join us two weeks from now on March 23rd for a special edition of Tuesdays with Lloyd's when we will welcome Lloyd's Chairman Bruce Carnegie Brown. Uh, Lloyd's Regional Director and President for the Americas, Hank Watkins, will host a conversation with the chairman, and it's certain to be an informative dialogue. And of course, the audience will have the opportunity to submit questions for the chairman. When our session ends today, a brief three-question survey will pop up on your browser. 
please do take a moment to fill these out and feel free to be candid and expansive in your comments. Uh, we're committed to providing you with the best content possible and your feedback is extremely helpful in shaping that content. You can also drop us a note anytime at usevents at lloyds.com. So let's keep staying connected and until March 23rd, goodbye and have a great rest of your day.